connected on this computer. That's correct. All right. Uh, we are recording. Okay, Mary. Um, let me introduce Mary Dono. She is a um, his art historian, and she's, she has spoken several times when we actually had a building for her to speak in <laughs> at the Hewlett Woodmere Public Library. And today she's going to do a lecture about Roy Lichtenstein, who was a famous American pop artist. Thank you, Mary. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And it's a thank, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I picked Roy Lichtenstein because um, uh, Nadine had mentioned that uh, Dr. Germano was going to be speaking about Jasper Johns. And I had put together a series that this and Jasper Johns were part of. They this group of American artists, and I even included David Hockney because he comes from England, he flourished here in, on the West Coast. But, um, so that's how these artists, um, they're of, about the same time, they tried all different media to uh, show their artwork. And um, just to put them in a little context, as we talk about his art in the 50s and the 60s, um, at the same time, you had the um, people like Jackson Pollock, and you had de Kooning, um, including Elaine de Kooning, with their work. So all of these very experimental artists were going on at the same time. So our friend Roy, his middle name is Fox, by the way, Roy Fox Lichtenstein, was born in New York City, family of German-Jewish uh, background, he grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and his father, Milton, was a real estate broker. His mother, Beatrice, was a homemaker, and he had a little sister, Renee. And as a child, he spent a lot of time listening to science fiction radio programs, visiting the American Museum of Natural History, which just reopened, building model airplanes and drawing. And um, as a teenager, he started to take watercolor classes at Parsons. And in high school, he even was started a jazz band. So you have a real art personality here. An avid jazz fan, he would go to the Apollo Theater, and he often drew pictures of the, of the musicians as they were playing their instruments. So one of the first paintings that I want to look at is this one uh, up here at the top. And um, I hope you don't mind the movement, but it's great. It's closer than you would see them at a museum, which I think is great. So here we have Stepping Out, and Stepping Out was done in 1978. So it's not an early picture, but it includes a number of his specialties, so to speak. Uh, it's marked by his customary restriction to primary colors. So you're seeing your yellow and red and blue. He has thick black outlines. You're seeing what the Bende dots that we'll be talking about, these dots, which um, he used in a very unique way. And the male figure in this is actually based on one of Leisure's pictures, the three musicians. So he has this um, a, a look here. Uh, he wears a, the character wears a straw hat, high collared shirt, striped tie, and um, the flower in his lapel is actually from another Leisure picture. The female figure looks a little bit like something Picasso might have done. Um, dramatically reduced, displaced features, um, surrealistic woman, and her face only has one eye, by the way, but that's not really a big problem, cascading blonde hair. Um, and uh, so it's complex, it's elaborate. The figures are different in appearance and they're united with their colors and their shapes. Um, we'll talk more about the Bende dots in a little while, but you see the World's Fair. This is um, the, uh, for the, um, motto was peace to understanding. Philip Johnson had this New York State Pavilion, which is now our Queens Theater. Um, and um, the, so a number of the artists were asked to provide pictures for it. And what Roy Lichtenstein provided was Girl in the Window. And what you're seeing at the lower left is what's really portrayed up here. Um, executed flat colors. You do have green in here, which is not, you know, a secondary color. And he depicts a smiling girl, uh, and a, a photograph of him um, as a young fellow. So in his last year of high school in 1939, he enrolled in summer classes at the Art Students League in New York, and he worked under Reginald March. Um, he left New York. He went to study in Ohio State University. 
It offered um, courses, studio courses, and a degree in fine arts. It, the study was interrupted by a three year stint in the army. And uh, so he served between 1943 and 1946. Um, he, he was in a training programs for languages, a training program for engineering, one for pilot training. All of the programs were canceled. He ended up serving as an orderly, a draftsman, and even an artist. When he returns home, he goes to visit his dying father. He's discharged um, with the eligibility for the GI Bill. So he goes back to Ohio. And he's under the supervision of a teacher named Hoyt L. Sherman, who had a tremendous impact on him. Um, it's so much so that when Lichtenstein had money much later, he funded at Ohio State University uh, a, Sher a Hoyt L. Sherman Studio Art Center. So that's how much he appreciated this. He uh, was hired himself as an art instructor, and he held that post on and off for about 10 years. He received a Master of Fine Arts, and he had his first solo exhibition in New York in 1951. And he started um, nurturing what would be uh, a longstanding uh, view of working with multimedia. So some of his early works uh, indicate his interest in American history, particularly in Native Americans. So what you have here is Washington crossing the Delaware from 1951, and the Assaboyans attacking a Blackfoot village. Um, now the date here is the date of the attack, the actual attack, he's replicating it in his art. Um, and you can see it, it, he gets the shapes, you get the idea, and he does it in a very unique style. Um, a few more, and we're going to come back to this because so does he in his career come back to his Native American interest. We have end of the trail, and actually both the upper and lower pictures here are titled end of the trail. He does them in watercolor and gouache. Um, the lower one, uh, this one is a woodcut here, and this one is two Sioux Indians. And you can see this is a one and two, and this is done as a woodcut. The, the sheet is about 18 by 12, so it's a good size woodcut, uh, and his, he indicates, um, he got involved with printmaking at Ohio State, and he was really adept at lithography, etching, woodcut, and he experiments with different papers. Um, he loves to try things. As, and this whole group of people that I mentioned before were really very interested in trying different things. So as we said, he explored the idea of cowboys and Indians, and, uh, and he gets married. So he undertakes some different jobs as draftsman, a window decorator, um, and his work fluctuates at this point between expressionism, cubism, Native American motifs, and he creates this rotating easel that he's able to paint from all angles. Um, that, not exactly what Jackson Pollock did, but you can see how they're experimenting. Jackson Pollock used the floor. Um, his wife used the, the tables in her room. There were all kinds of different ways of doing things. Um, he, uh, his, he says, I paint my own pictures upside down or sideways. I don't even remember what most of them are about. The subjects are not what hold my interest. But he gets married in June 1949, and he marries Isabel Wilson Sariski. They stay married until legally until 1965. And they have two children. Um, when I first started doing this, I didn't have this picture. I love the picture of the two boys. The uh, older is David and the younger is Mitchell. Um, they're born in 54 and 56. And now he starts to be represented by the Joseph, John Heller Gallery in New York. And he takes an assistant professor position in SUNY Oswego in 1957. Now he's got a young family. The win upstate winters are brutal and they take a toll on his marriage. Um, what he does up there, he uses his thickly textured paint and abstract imagery. He draws from the American expressionist um, style, but he starts to incorporate figures into his canvases um, and we're going to see some of that. So. He continues to teach, he moves with the idea of making things a little better to Rutgers in New Jersey and New Brunswick at the Douglas Residential College. 
um, and he meets a fellow named Alan Capro. Uh, he, the environment helps his interest in pop, uh, proto-pop art Im imagery. 1961, he begins his first pop paintings using cartoon imagery, but I'm showing you these because they're indicative of his wife's feelings at the time. These are Crying Girl, and um, the one to the left is from 63, and the one to the right is from 64. Um, at, but you, so this is Roy and Isabel in Columbus in Ohio in about 1950. But it was a tough time for their marriage. Now, one of the iconic things that he does are these bills. And this is his $10 bill from 1956. Now, this is a lithograph. And um, the, it's referred to as the dollar bill. Uh, it's considered a combination of Americana and uh, Americana art and cubism and the beginnings of his work. So this is one of the early works that he has. Six, thir 25 editions of the lithograph were made and they were exhibited in several galleries. Now he starts to do this type of stuff, which is fun. Uh, Rotobroil came out in 1961. Now, lest you think it's a small picture, it's 68 inches by 68 inches, very big rotobroil. And again, it's black and white with his kind of reddish uh, surround. He had a solo show at the Leo Castelli Gallery in February of 1962. And the Castelli Gallery was um, not the, the epitome, but it was a, a very well thought of gallery. Um, it sold, his work sold out before it opened, and Rotobroil was one of the paintings that he showed. It was acquired at Sotheby's in 1976 for $75,000. So it's just an appliance. It's placed symmetrically. It's against a uniform field of red and uh, very simplified. We also have an electric cord. The electric cord is 28 inches long. And it was bought for $750 from Leo Castelli. It disappeared in 1970. Um, and in uh, 2007, Barbara Castelli, now Barbara Castelli is the second wife of Leo Castelli. Um, she had inherited the art gallery when her husband died in 1999. She listed the electric cord with a registry of missing and stolen art, and it was located. So um, it was shipped from Bogota in Colombia, and um, the lawyers for Castelli claimed in 2012 that the painting, now we're talking about this painting of the electric cord, was worth $4 million. Um, so this is, you're seeing her at a news conference there. And we also have Turkey. Uh, yeah, Turkey is from 1961, and Turkey is a good sized Turkey, 26 by 30. Um, and so it, he uses these personal objects. Now he does starts abstractions, and this again, it's abstract time uh, for us. Uh, he makes changes abruptly, and this is one of them. And sometimes within the same year, you'll see very different typed work. So he goes back and forth. So it's, this presentation is somewhat chronological, but you're going to see a lot of back and forth. Um, so 1959, new energetic brushwork, specifically in the mode of the abstract expressionist, um, and he starts to focus on it. And these are, a lot of his work is untitled, so we're kind of struck with his untitled. The two that I just put up are the later ones. So this is from 59 and 60. When he comes back to this, he does, he calls them something else. So let's do these. This is untitled from 59 untitled from uh, 1960. And then you have Brushwork with Still Life 4 from 1956 and Abstraction 1. Uh, let me go back. Well, I'm just going to, I can move the faces and sometimes I need to do that in order to look at the pieces. So what he's done is he's taken these brush strokes and he has a whole movement of brush strokes which will come up on. And he's combined it with his solid pieces, uh, his primary colors and his black and white. So he's taken something that he started with in the late 50s and modified it. Now, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the magna, magma of paint and um, bende dots. So magna is the, we talk about him using that he, uh, he's known for both of these type, these media that he uses in his painting. 
Magna Paint is an acrylic rosin paint, and it was developed by a company called, uh, a gentleman named Bocour, and sold with Bocour artists, starting in 1947. It's different from modern acrylic paint because it has pigments ground in acrylic rosin, and they're brought into an emulsion with solvents. So you have a, a different consistency. It has more of a shine than some of the other paints do, a glossier finish. And in about 1960, they actually fine-tuned that, and they called it Aquatech. So it, the modern stuff is water-soluble. Uh, magna is only soluble or miscible with turpentine or mineral spirits, um, but it dries very rapidly, and you can, get, you can buy paints that will dry to a matte finish or a glossy finish. Um, and then these are Bende dots. So this is a, a sculpture, and we'll see the sculpture later with our group of sculptures. This is from Barcelona, and the dots are very large. So how does he get the dots? Well, these are typical dot screens. Um, it's a piece of acrylic, of a, like a plastic, that the dots are. You go to your local store, and you buy the types of sheets with the, the color and the size of dots that you want and they can then be rubbed onto whatever you're doing. So these would be the dots that went with something like this. Um, and so that he's picked up using that and he added it to his work. Um, and they, uh, there's ways to make them half-tone dots. So he's 38 years old. He's been exhibiting in New York for a decade and he starts to do Mickey Mouse. Um, he, the breakthrough is uh, announced as a pop art style. Yeah. The origins go back to a story about his children. Um, the, he, it's, in 1957, he started to use an opaque to, to draw trace large images of Mickey Mouse on his son Mitchell's wall. Later that year, he started, these are drawings that he made back in 57, the beginning of 58. So he makes this series of five drawings that appear um, in uh, a gallery de devoted to it. And this is his Look Mickey. So Look Mickey is actually done in 1961. Again, you have the primary colors, you have um, the standard idea of laughing, Mickey's laughing, and you can see the, the hook is into the back of the coat. Now, you know this little golden book. This is Donald Duck's um, Lost and Found. His style's in transition. Um, he would come to be known for the heavy black outlines, and he ends up being in um, Life magazine. So you have uh, the next one. Uh, we talked about Look Mickey. Um, and he, what he does, let, just let's look at this for a sec. What, this is the picture that he took it from. Now, he doesn't get in too much trouble for copying the pictures. Once in a while, an artist will call him on it, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but he took this picture, he reversed it, he took out a lot of the background, so you have your plain yellow background, and he made his own story out of it. Now, he doesn't always need to make his own story. Sometimes the story on the picture is enough, but so here, this is, um, I can see the whole world. So it's like we're in the dark room. We're in the black room, and somebody's got this little window into us, and he's saying, I can see the whole room and nobody's in it. Well, it comes from this cartoon. And um, it teases the viewer who's given the feeling they're in the dark room, viewed by the main subject. The speech bubble makes the whole canvas relevant. It broadens the attention. And uh, he adds a little bit of color to what was really a black and white image. This, this is the black, this image here is a 1961 William Overgaard drawing from a Steel Roper cartoon story. And um, our friend Roy Lichtenstein's picture sold for 43.2 million in Christie's in 2011. So he certainly took the cartoon and did the best with it. Um, as we said, he's displaying his work at Leo Castelli's. He has his one man show in 1962. And um, he starts the, uh, a group of paintings at that point about solitary household objects like sneakers and hot dogs. Well, first you have your washing machine. And um, your washing machine picture is 
56 inches by 68 inches. And I think the size is important, the magnitude of what he's showing, a, um, a spray. They're taken straight from the ideal home. This is the home that's going to be in the World's Fair, the uh, tomorrow, the world of tomorrow, all of these great things that we use to make life easier. Um, they, the palette, the important detergents, the sparkling surfaces, and even the garbage pail is glorified. Now he does the, I want, it's called um, a step on can with leg because the leg is important. She's stepping down to open the top of the can and he does it as a diptych, almost as a religious diptych, two panels would be done. Um, so he brings it to us that way. Uh, and then we have Keds. So Keds he puts um, in a starburst. Um, and the kids were what every guy wanted to wear at that point. Their, and their appeal lies in their oversimplification. Now this is engagement ring, and I just came across this. One of the most popular um, Lichtensteins in the exhibition that this is talking about is, um, uh, it features a man placing a sparkling diamond on a daintily manicured figure. When the painting went on view at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, Security guards reported men going down on one knee, ring in hand, to propose to their girlfriends in front of it. Roy would have loved that, said Dorothy. That Dorothy is a second wife. We'll meet her in a few minutes. She said he promised his soul to science and his heart to Dorothy. And we have that. But kind of fun thinking about people doing that. And you also have your hot dog with mustard, which is four feet long. That's your more than your foot long hot dog. Um, moving on to Masterpiece. So Masterpiece is from 1962. It's a square picture, 54 inches square, and um, it's known for its narrative com content because it kind of predicts Lichtenstein's fame. It says, why, Brad, darling, this painting is a masterpiece. My, soon you'll have all of New York clamoring for your work, and soon he did. Um, so the source of the image uh, was a comic book. This is another one of his pictures with the words. I'm going to move our folks over here. So this way. And this is a mom talking to her daughter. And her daughter's saying, I have something uh, in the kitchen for you to eat. And she says, I'm not hungry. And the girl is telling us what's on the left-hand picture, which is I tried to reason it out, tried to see things from mom and dad's point of view. I try not to think of Eddie, so my mind would be clear and common sense could take over, but Eddie kept coming back. And um, one of the first of the Eddie pictures, this is called the Eddie Diptych. And that's the close up of them speaking. So you can see you, all of the iconic things, the black and white, the outlines, the um, basically the primary colors. So in 1963, he takes um, a leave of absence from his teaching position at Rutgers, and he's starting to find fame, not just in America, but worldwide. He moves back to New York to be the center of the art scene and concentrate on his painting. He was using this oil and magma for things like Drowning Girl. And Drowning Girl also features your outlines. Um, it has a different color pattern uh, we, than we had seen before. And it's, he's starting to use the Bende dots. Um, it, he said about the, that the American Expressionists put things down on canvas and responded to what they had done to the color and positions and sizes. He says, my style looks completely different, but the nature of putting down lines is pretty much the same. Mine just don't come out looking calligraphic like Pollock's or Klein's. So he's comparing himself. This Drowning Girl comes from this comic book. And um, by the way, Drowning Girl lives at MoMA. Um, and by 1963, he settled on a procedure by which he first reproduced thing, a, a chosen panel from a cartoon on by hand. So he makes a small drawing, projects it with his opaque projector, traces it on canvas, and fills in the images with um, his, prime, his bold colors and the Bende dots. And it didn't come without controversy. He, there was a Life Magazine article 
that uh, called him perhaps one of the worst artists in America, could have been tongue in cheek, but he started to show in major exhibitions. Um, and uh, Drowning Girl is, uh, certainly was one of them. Uh, Drowning Girl is, uh, comes from Run for Love, which was a melodramatic cover, cover for uh, a DC comic. And in the original, the Drowning Girl's uh, boyfriend appears in the background, clinging to the boat. You can see him here. Okay, but what Lichtenstein does is he simplifies it and he brings us up close. He crops the image, he removes the boat and the boyfriend. So it looks like she's all by herself. And um, he, she, he um, modifies what she's saying rather than, I, um, I don't care if I have a cramp. He just says, she just says in his, I, just, I don't care. I'd rather sink than call Brad for help. Um, and um, she, she, Brad is a name he starts to use. He thinks it's um, sort of an everyman kind of name. So he does Wham, and he does a couple of these for, um, the, uh, this is now 1963, and it's done, taken again from a comic strip. It's a diptych because it's on uh, the two panels here. The left-hand panel shows a fighter plane firing a rocket that in the right-hand panel hits the second plane, explodes in flames, and you start to get your words. Um, it, it, the words go all the way back to the beginning of the, the 20th century with people like the Cubists who used words, um, Durain and, and all fellows like um, um, uh, uh, Matisse and Durain and, and that group, they started to use some words in their paintings um, and here we are, we're moving into the pop art and we're back to the words, uh, particularly the expressive words in the pictures. So he's cover he covers the image from several panel book, uh, comic book panels, and he transforms it into this. Um, it was, it's regarded for its temporal, spatial, and psychological integration in the two panels. Um, and we have one more of that, and this is as I opened fire, and this is a triptych, and each one of them is a little bit different. If you follow through, they each have a diagonal. So he, keep, he brings our, our eye across the panels, uh, and the source was All American Men of War, the April, uh, March, April, 1962 issue, and it's the um, original artist was Jerry Grat Gradinetti, and it, his title was Wingmate of Doom. So this is perhaps his most ambitious exercise in uniting these pictures. So it, it, it's of imagination, and it, the idea of wham and brat and all of these words are that part of speech, that onomatopoeia, where you get the, the feeling from the sound of the word. Um, and what he says is the minor purpose of my war paintings is to put military aggressiveness in an absurd light. My personal opinion is that much of our foreign policy, and look at where we are, um, has been unbelievably terrifying. Um, so, but that's not what my work is about. I don't want to capitalize on it. Um, so now we move and we get, um, we rose up slowly. And I, this, pic, this photograph is great because it shows you the scale of the pictures. Um, he, he did very, very large works and he could have his, the work that he originally di did blown up. So the, these folks are underwater and they say we rose up slowly as if we didn't belong to the outside world. Um, a luscious blonde, a handsome uh, man in a steamy embrace. How could it be bad? Um, and back to Brad. So here we have a person who is not very happy, this young lady, with her blue dress and her yellow hair. Um, she says, I know how you must feel, Brad. Um, and it's a, a, a post-1963 comic-based woman, looks hard, crisp, brittle, and uniformly modish in appearance. Like they all came out of the same pot, was one of the criticisms but it came from this comic strip. And uh, he says the name Brad sounded heroic to him and he used it to, uh, with the aim of cliched oversimplification. 
So we have Jeff. Um, we have a nice photograph of our friend Roy. Um, this work, this work. Oh, Jeff, I love you too. But um, magna ma oil, four feet by four feet, and um, the sketch was done in graphic and colored pencils, and it was done on a little piece of paper, four and three quarter by four and three quarter inches, and then it was um, with the opaque projector projected up and finished out. Um, it sold for. Um, in 1980, it sold for 210,000. And we see him in his studio here. Um, this is 36 West 26th Street, and this is 1964. Um, by the mid 60s, he's creating very large scale murals, um, including the one for uh, the World's Fair. I wanted to put this one in. This is Nurse, and it's done about the same time. The, and I started, I had done this presentation before and then I did it as this whole COVID shutdown was happening. So putting the nurse in was important. Um, it's a quintessential Lichtenstein um, heroine. She's again, four feet by four feet, her beautiful blue eyes. And um, she was sold to an anonymous buyer in 2015 for $95 million. So it gives you some idea of the value of uh, how people value his work, but also um, just one of our heroes for this time. Um, 1960 does these large scale murals. So you have two sides of a lobby here. And this is the University of Dusseldorf and it's the brushstroke mural. So remember when we saw those um, kind of abstract paintings that went, then went into the brushstroke? Here are brushstroke murals, very large brushstrokes. And he's combined them with some other shapes for this. So there are some Vende dots involved in it. You can see some of it down here. And I think also on this panel here. Um, it was created in 1970 and uh, it, uh, the revered status of the painterly mark uh, and a gesture of control rather than spontaneity. And uh, this is great. This is a mural with blue brush strokes. This is New York City. It was originally the AXA Equitable Center. It's 787 7th Avenue. And it was done between 1984 and 86. So what, what this little section of the presentation shows you some of the large mural-like works. Um, and so he has a cacophony of, of figures. So you have a beach ball with the rays going up, uh, a brush stroke with, that really gives us water coming down. You have your iconic um, housewife doing her cleaning. You have um, symbol, um, this architect symbols here, the, the tools that they need. And you have some of the other drawings that he has. And there was a whole book made about this. This is the art of Roy Lichtenstein. And you have the um, mural on the front here. He used, uh, in this one, he used 18 colors instead of the five that he usually used, the five being black, white, and your uh, primary colors. So here, there's 18. Um, uh, this is, uh, your, the waterfall is great. So let's get out of here. And the Bauhaus staircase. So the Bauhaus staircase, the original pictures are at MoMA, but this was done in Beverly Hills, um, 9830 Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills. Um, the Creative Arts Agency commissioned I.M. Pei to design their new headquarters in Beverly Hills. A postmodern building completed in 1989, and uh, Lichtenstein was asked to create a large-scale mural. So what he does is he goes back to Oscar Schindler's Bauhaus stairs. This is, was painted in 1932. And it had a tremendous major symbolic imp uh, importance in uh, modern art. So the, the original canvas here was 68, uh, 63 by 45, done in 1932. And it depicts the Bauhaus, the school founded by Gropius um, and, and for its visionary integration of technology and art and design. And this is the mural that Lichtenstein creates. And there's a picture here that shows it um, up on the wall. So you can see the, the dimensions of it in this beautiful IMP uh, created building. I, I just think seeing it in places, uh, wonderful. Bende dots, P 
people marching up the staircase, um, ready to learn all about the modern art. And one for the Tel Aviv Museum. This was done also in 1989, and it's 23 by 56 feet. I want to get us in a little closer. I'm thrilled with the zoom. Um, it's located, as we said, in Israel, and it was a gift from Liechtenstein to the museum. It figures a po it features a potpourri of of feature of figures sourced from the artist's own work, but also from Picasso and from uh, Oscar Schlemmer that we saw before, from Marc Chagall, from uh, um, Alexander Archipenko. And so the director of the museum described it as art about art about art. It depicts a whole century of art and the exchanges between figurative and abstract. And as you see on the left side, you have all of these different pieces and on the right, the geometrics that go parallel with them and Times Square. So I don't know if we've ever noticed all this. This is um, a Times Square mural. It's at the 42nd Street Station. It's um, 16 panels, 53 feet long, enamel on metal, and um, it, it's actually porcelain enamel on steel, most of it. And there's a book about it, which you see up in the upper right-hand corner. And it uh, shows um, the dynamics of movement. It, uh, energy and uh, transportation. So get to back to the brush strokes. So uh, what he did was he took something like this was, was your cartoon and he has this whole extensive over decades century uh, of brush strokes. Uh, it's, uh, the paintings were um, a style that uh, he figured he used a broad house painter's brush and years after the series was completed he claimed and i don't know if you'll agree um, that the source for the series was actually the renaissance artist franz halls now i love franz halls i'm not necessarily sure i make the connection but i want to share that that's what roy thought um, so what we have here is um, 1965 brush strokes, which is at the Tate Modern. Um, the yellow and green, which is um, at a museum in Frankfurt. This is 15 feet long, this lower right-hand one. And this is titled The Little Big Painting. And The Little Big Painting is 68 inches by 80. It's at the Whitney. So in the mid-90s, the brush stroke reemerged and it had a new form. Uh, so we'll see some of the 1980s um, work in a little while. What I wanted to show you was that he starts experimenting with sculpture. And I, I, I'm impressed, uh, as I've sort of alluded to, with the creativity of the artist during this time. It may be that one particular painting isn't my favorite, but my, what's my favorite is the fact that they keep trying to use different media and different styles. So what he does is he collaborates with the ceramicist who sculpts a head out of clay, obviously, and uh, Lichtenstein applies a glaze and he creates graphic motifs. So there are quite a number of these. What you're seeing here is that they don't have extremely creative titles. You have head of a girl, you have head with red shadow, and you have head with blue shadow. Uh, they're um, 15 inches high, so they'd make a great piece for your sideboard. They really, um, just something very unique and different. Landscapes. So remember when we saw the mural that was on the building in Manhattan? It had this at the top of it. So this was one of his landscapes. Now he did this in the 60s, and he then put it on that mural later on. So at, he, there are many different series. So this is his landscapes. He um, does them in his own way, and the top, the, one, the first one here is Sunrise. Sunrise is um, sold at Christie's for 16 million. It's um, 36 by 68 inches. It's, um, so now it's in a private collection. And Sunset, Sunset is smaller. Sunset is 20 inches by 24. Uh, but just gives you something different. Um, I want, he also used these kind of, um, they're, again, they're all, like an acetate material and they can be rubbed and he creates different types of landscapes with them. 
So you have seascape here. Uh, you see the dots. You can, um, if, once I do that, I can't just, let me do this and this, and then I'll, we'll make it bigger. Um, you can see his use of the dots, but also this more creative style here. So this one is seashore, and um, you have a, a landscape here, pink landscape. And again, you have this type of almost a woven appearance, different from dots. Um, and down here, which we probably don't need this for, is um, this uh, lands landscape. This, is, um, this one is at MoMA, and the others are in private collections. And I've come across these that I really think are worth showing. These are also different type. They're a little bit, the night seascape is uh, just a, absolutely beautiful. It's a, it done in felt. Um, it, there was obviously a drawing that preceded it, but there's a felt reproduction of that um, at the Smithsonian. It uh, was created in 1966 and it's um, eight feet tall. So it's a very large picture. And uh, this to the, the left here is just very uh, using the brush strokes to create a landscape. So uh, I, I uh, this is called sailboat, but it's uh, that's what he's doing with it. So he gets an opportunity to design a poster for Lincoln Center in 1966, and it's for the film festival. The original is at MoMA, and he incorporates this. I, I, you get the feeling here; it's from the World's Fair. Uh, this is the um, the sense of it. Um, done in Art Deco. Now, the 60s was an interesting time. I, I was um, telling Nadine that I, I put together this, a series with um, Art Deco and Surrealism and the Harlem Renaissance and whatever. So the, the Art Deco comes obviously earlier. The, the midpoint was uh, a show in the mid-20s, but it has a, a redo kind of in the 60s. And this is part of a, a, a revival of Art Deco. So his poster is right in the, the, the modern uh, style. Uh, uh, he creates this for the festival and um, he moves into a series. Again, this 1966, you've seen that year before, here's another series, this is modern painting. And modern paintings and sculptures, he isolated and recreated def decorative, no mo no decorative motifs and they could be found on skyscrapers. Step back skyscrapers were part of Art Deco. It um, derived from actually uh, public uh, uh, policy of how buildings needed to be built, but also from theater marquees and plush interiors like Radio City Music Hall. Um, so you have uh, the, this idea of Art Deco coming back, the renaissance of it. Um, just a, the first one is my up here is modern painting with a bolt and um, This down here is modern painting triptych and uh, as you can see it's the same across um, Now this is for Expo 67 in Montreal It's a 30 feet high by 10 feet wide done as a triptych and it, you, you kind of take your diagonals down and down again um, it's, he found inspiration in his daily life and consumer goods and his big modern painting is an example from his series. Um, and again, they look back at uh, Art Deco. Now he marries for the second time in 1968. This lady is really an interesting lady. Um, you see her as a very young person here and she's matured. She's still with us. And, uh, so they rent a house out in Southampton in 1966 that Larry Rivers, one for the art world, had um, bought around the corner from his own house. Three years later, they buy a 1910 carriage house facing the ocean on Gin Lane. And from 1970 till his death, he split his time between Manhattan and Southampton, and they had a house on Captiva Island. So I, I, some wonderful pictures of Dorothy. She's got his works behind her and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about her later. But look at this modern sculpture series. This is Art Deco to the nth degree. So let me get them up here. So you have this, which is um, the Art Deco version of a, 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 um, a, in a theater where you'd have a divide. It's called Long Modern Sculpture. It's um, 
four feet long. It's at the Nat Norton Simon Museum at the moment. It's machine-like precision, patterned repetition of geometric forms from the Art Deco style. And um, sometimes they refer to the, I, what I have in my paper is the Art Deco style of the 30s. But it really started before that. And by the time you got to the 30s, there, was, there were changes. So the 20s and the 30s. Um, he saw something like this as being two-dimensional, even though we might say it's three-dimensional, it's actually 12 inches thick, because you can only see it from one, from two sides at one time in his idea. Um, you have modern sculpture with a velvet rope. So you have your two pieces of these beautifully constructed sculptures and your rope that brings them together. Um, well, I'm gonna get out of this for a sec so I can, up. Oh, look over here. Um, this one is sculpture with a glass wave and the glass wave is here. So it's a very, uh, very finely done. And this one here is Untitled Head. And Untitled Head has, as well as an Art Deco, it has a connection with his interest in Native America that we've seen before. So now he's commissioned in 1970 by the Los Angeles Ah, there we go. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, commissioned by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art to make a film. Now, it turned out he only made one, but I'm going to tell you about it. He, um, with the help of Universal Film Studios, he conceived of and produced three landscapes. Now, three landscapes was a film of marine landscapes directly related to a series of collages with those landscape themes that we looked at that he had developed from 64 to 66. He thought he was going to produce 15 short films. Um, that's not the way it worked out. So he has a three screen installation and he made it with a fellow from New York, Joel Friedman, and it turned out to be his only venture in film. Um, but I wanted you to be able to see that. Now he does mirror paintings. And as um, it's funny because no matter how, my, how I look at this, I went back and checked the, they're not on mirrors, they're on canvas but he's so creative in his painting that they really truly look like their mirrors, not that one so much, but this one, and this one with the reflection. So um, the, the, this one has six panels here, six um, rectangular um, vertical panels, and uh, it's among the most ambitious. It's um, 10 feet by 11 feet. So you can, I get the idea of how, strain, how uh, large it is. And you get a stylized gleam and shadow that are reflected so that it really kind of looks like a mirror. He does oval mirror and um, this one here, which I, is really very kind of pretty, very simple mirror. Another mural, this is Peach to Chemistry and it was one, the first of four print and one bronze version. It's, um, 17 inches by 102 inches, and it's at the Reynolds House Museum of Art in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So it's a triptych, but it's filled with um, symbols. Uh, it's divided in three panels. Each panel, as we saw once before, has a, a diagonal. So this, he sticks to some of it. So the, the colors are, again, your primary colors and black and white, those five main colors that he uses. The in terms of printing it, and just a little information, the yellow areas were printed first, followed by the flat red areas, then the bende dots in red and, and the bende dots in blue, and then it, it, the half tone, which you see over here on the side, um, on the right, um, it's the superimposition of the blue bende dots on yellow. So that's how he gets them. So it's very stylized. And you, here you have black and white, it, it um, looks like a plant. So that's one thing. You have a microscope here. And what's kind of, it took me, you have a, a face that's on an angle with the fellow looking into the microscope. So his eye is behind your nose and mouth. And the cogs of the wheels. And then you have another gentleman here with his hair and his eye and his face and holding the test tube. So um, 
there's uh, the questions about it. You have cogs and pulleys, but was he being ironical? Now, um, this was done, let me just get the year one more time because I did it. This was done in, uh, too, like too easy, 1970. 1970 was close to the tail end of the Vietnam War. So was he being ironical at a time when the United States military had used Agent Orange in Southeast Asia as part of a program to defeat the Viet Cong by destroying the forests and the livelihood of the peasants? Or was he just thinking about things get better with chemistry, um, which was the motto for DuPont? So I'm not too sure either. Now these are entablatures, and entablatures, there was an exhibition of these at the Whitney. Um, it uh, was the tail end of, of 2019, and it stayed there till to the beginning of 2020. Beginning of 2020, the Whitney had an exhibition on the Mexican muralists, but, so it, which I went to see, and they, had, they still had these entablatures. So the entablatures were um, a, a series of paintings, and the source were photographs that, that um, Roy took on the buildings, the institutional buildings around New York City, around Wall Street. And his goal was to ascertain the minimum information required to build paintings that would read as architrave, cornice, frieze, um, the th which are the three components of classical entablature. So these are some examples. So this is titled entablature. They all, some of them have numbers. So this was in tablature eight, and this is Roman number four. Um, again, this is beautifully colored, painted, um, very classically designed and carefully orchestrated, but uh, he takes them very seriously. And this is a kind of a fun picture. It's called Two Paintings with Dotto. Um, it's 50 inches by 42 inches. It's in a private collection because it's sold for $4.2 million in uh, 2017. So um, he did a lot of interaction with famous artists. And in order to keep this somewhere in the ballpark of the time that I have, I took out a few, but I want to show you some. So he took Claude Monet's Rouen Cathedral, and he depicts it as a triptych here um, with, in different styles. So you have, um, it, it, you know, Monet painted from his hotel room across from the Rouen Cathedral, and um, it's uh, hit, um, Roy's set is called Rouen Cathedral Set Five in 1969. Uh, Lichtenstein responds by reducing the intricate approach to his dot painting to this. Um, so he transforms it into a uh, modern mass-produced reproduction. We did some others. So um, these are Matisse paintings. This is Matisse's red studio, and uh, which is at MoMA, and his pink studio, which is at the Pushkin in Moscow. And these are Lichtenstein's. So you get, um, uh, this one even has Look Mickey in it. This one is titled Artist Studio from 1973. And uh, they're big, big pictures. Uh, spare you the, the, the inches, but they're big. And here he uses Matisse's The Dance. Um, this one is owned by MoMA, uh, but you can see the dance in it. It's um, eight feet by 10 feet. It's a huge picture uh, with his yellow lemons and his, his green. Um, again, another Matisse that he took off, to, off from Still Life with Goldfish, um, and uh, we get the Lichtenstein version with a, a tennis uh, uh, golf ball up in the corner here, rather than these lovely, beautiful flowers. But he, it's, he did it with, um, let me see, we have one more, still live with Picasso, with the eyes, the Lichtenstein version. Um, it, it, he called it, homage, he had a whole portfolio called Homage to Picasso, and uh, so he did that. Now this one is um, also along the same vein. Excuse me, so what you're looking at is The Red Horseman, which was done in 1913 by Carlo Carra. And uh, it, it, Carlo Carra was a futurist, and he, which in the futurism uh, communicated pathos, speed, heroicism, this whole idea of modern, modern machines, modern speed. And so your horse is going very quickly. And of course we have our friend Roy Lichtenstein's horse. 
um, the Red Horseman from 1974, very much larger than um, Paulo Carras, but kind of a lot of fun. And uh, a forest scene, and this one is, uh, as you look at it, you'll see it's, the horses are entwined with these, uh, with the trees. Lots of color, a lot of uh, outlining of shapes and things, but he brings us the modern, this is 1980. Now there was a series, BMW car project was introduced by the French race car driver, Hervé uh, Poulain, and he wanted to invite artists to create a canvas on an automobile. Um, uh, so they, okay, I was trying to think of the word for it. They call it wrapping, wrapping the car. And uh, I happened to meet somebody once who did that for a living. But anyway, 1975, he gets, this is um, Alexander Calder's version. This one is Frank Stella, Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, David Hockney, and Jeff Koons. So where is, oh, okay. No, I knew the answer to that. So this is Lichtenstein's. And um, they, uh, the cars were not all raced at all. They were used um, as uh, uh, to uh, sell the cars and to uh, as publicity for BMW. There are some cars that are placed in different showrooms, so there's, the, there's ways to see some of them. But we have Roy in his um, studio creating them, and, and uh, kind of a fun version with his Bende dots and his uh, even some green in it. Now he gets commissioned to do Mermaid down in, in um, Miami Beach. This is the Fillmore Miami Beach at the Jackson, at the Jackie Gleason Theater. And um, what you're seeing are really two views of this. It's, uh, I know one looks blue and one looks red. I think it's a lot to do with the light. It's not that there were two versions of it. Sunlight has a lot to do with it. Um, so the original $100,000 commission included a $50,000 National Endowment for the Arts grant and dollar matching by art aficionados. Um, the work continued his theme of depicting ephemeral events in physical form with rays of sunlight on the mermaid's body. So these are your rays of sunlight. You can see them better here with the different colors. Um, and he gets the palm tree, incorporates his palm tree right into it. Um, uh, so uh, a water-filled pool and the mermaid is dazzlingly silly and provocative. So we're back to some of the figures that are grounded in Native American art. And you have um, landscape with figures and rainbow. This one is titled Powwow. And the one in the middle is a, a sculpture and it's called Amaranth Figure. The Amaranth, I'm going to give you close-ups of the others, but Amaranth Figure is 65 inches tall and indicative of the work that he's doing at that point. Um, what he does is create his landscape using a lot of the things that we've seen together already. A lot of the diagonal lines in, in both black and in red. Um, he does give us the, um, the rainbow here, but your trees, things are outlined. They're mostly primary, a little bit of secondary color, very strong pictures. Um, and this one is seven feet by 10 feet. Um, the one on the other side. Here, powwow is a combination of things. You have black and white figures here. Um, this almost looks like a candy cane as it comes down on the side here. But you can see the what we call teepees um, here in the middle. We, um, the, you, the sun here with the clouds, your eye that we've seen he, he uses in his own way becomes an icon for him. So he takes his shapes and incorporates them. Uh, Powell also is eight by 10. Um, he does uh, a combination. So you have Amarin landscape and little landscape. Little landscape really is not so small. Uh, Little Landscape is um, 36 by 48, and it's sold for 3.6 million. You're seeing, again, here you have your cactus in the right-hand picture, um, some, some symbolism from Native American lore. Um, on this side, you see feathers, just some more things that we 
um, considered uh, among that culture. I just, what I want to do is show you these because they're done in, in very different ways. So here you have two figures in the end from um, 1979. It's um, oil and magma, it's 70 inches by 86 inches and it's in a private collection. Um, and to here you have house uh, face and feather. Um, actually this one is face and feather. This is on, on uh, linen and this one is a woodcut. So you would cut and lithograph, it's only 28 by 28. It depicts um, a totem pole in the middle here. And I'll, across the totem pole is a piece of rope that goes down the side. Um, and you have a, uh, uh, the eyes here are square, the cross for the nose, almost that what you'd call a cruciform nose. And um, uh, the mouth is not in a happy, would not be one of our happy shapes. Um, it's the palette is limited to reddish brown and black and white, and the white paper consists of the rest of the image. He's just simply left it white, um, zigzag right edge, and then um, you have these uh, marks coming out from here. This image, so it's the it's, uh, a series of prints that he's made. Now, one of the things um, that I should have showed you when we had one of the murals up because you can see it on that. Um, it passed, it's, it's called his Perfect Imperfect series. So I'm going to show you some pictures and let's see if we can figure out what's perfect and what's imperfect. If I tell you that this one is perfect and I tell you that this one and this one is imperfect, um, would you notice, because I don't know if I would have at first, how they come outside of the rectangle? And it does so here also. So he considered that the imperfect. So they're, they're definitely um, graphic designs uh, that he created, uh, but he has this whole theory of perfect and imperfect, and this is an imperfect sculpture. So um, his imperfect sculpture is from 1995, um, it's 30 by 34 inches, and it's in a private collection. Uh, now, he did do uh, uh, two anti-apartheid posters. Each one is simply called Against Apartheid. What he incorporated are his brush strokes, um, strokes with his um, broad brushes. The, uh, this is a mirror kind of image where you have your, your frame around it and then your diagonals. Uh, he, there was an addition of 300 as well as 30 artist proofs, and they were sold um, in order to raise money. I just want to point out, as much as they seem to be black and white, if you look, he's starting to incorporate more shading here. So you have more colors coming in. This might even be an eye up here. Uh, he doesn't tell us that, but sometimes it's fun to look. Um, Jasper Johns, I um, wanted to take a look and see Jasper John's um, um, Jasper John's uh, flag paintings um, were done well before this but he did this series that he calls he doesn't call them flags he calls them forms in space and they're at slightly different sizes they're um, the two on the top are magma and oil on canvas the bottom ones are screen prints and they, so many additions are made. Uh, and he, what he integrates is the ready-made quality of screen prints and a painterly gesture. Um, rather than the stars, you see the bende dots. Uh, and the, uh, uh, instead of horizontal lines as we would have, you now have your diagonals. Now he has a reflection series. And the reflection series, you kind of almost have to look carefully at to get, they're lithographs. And um, it, he simplifies the idea of it. This is the reflection of a girl. And what you're seeing is her inside a, a window. So you, again, there's some words in here, but we're looking at her as though through a window. I love this one because this is like Sweet Pea from Popeye. The baby's screaming and you can just feel it. Um, this is a, num a numbered set of 60, uh, an edition of 68, and a reflection in, on a soda fountain. Soda fountains being so iconic from the 60s and before, 
Um, he's brought them up to date in the 80s, uh, late 80s. So, um, and so another series, his interior series, um, there's a reference in this one. Uh, this is called The Red Lamps. And if you look all the way over here, this is a um, kind of a reference to Jackson Pollock and what Jackson Pollock had done. Red Lamps is done in 1990, so he's looking back at Pollock's work. But um, this one is The Den. And in the den, he has uh, his mirrors. He has a clear uh, coffee table and his red lamp. And look at the walls and the bende dots. So this one is living room. Uh, lots of red. Um, his paintbrush series hanging on the wall and reflections. Uh, and the, um, this one is wallpaper with a blue floor from 1992 and it's nine feet by 13 feet so lest you think it's a small little picture um now he does these this is inside the studio and i think these are great to look at because again it shows a scale it, what we're seeing is him working so here he is and he's working on these very large pictures all around him and here he's just kind of relaxing but it uh, gives us a sense look at the chair that he's created this is his creation um it, it's, um, I'm sorry, uh, there we go. It's a, a flowing brushstroke down the chair, very modern, great chair. Um, and here he is finishing up one of the rooms. Now he moves to a, a really entirely different style, uh, influenced uh, by the Chinese style. When I look at this one, I think of um, Edgar Degas' monotypes that there was a show of his work um, at, um, I think, MoMA uh, a number, a few years ago. But this is, these would be, his, that would look like his later monotype where he incorporated the painting within it. But this, so he, um, um, what I've done was put one of Degas' paintings up here. This is Landscape from 1892, and it's the pastel over it. So when, when Lichtenstein picks up on it, it's not quite the same, but you kind of get the same amorphous feeling from it. Um, again, you can see his bende dots. This one is from, um, uh, let me turn the page because I switched the order of these. I kind of like it better this way. This is Landscape in Fog and um, Landscape with Philosopher. And you can see why this would be the philosopher here. Um, Scholar's Rock. And this one is Yellow Cliffs. So again, within his work, he's adding color that we hadn't seen. And uh, a little bit of red here just to keep us grounded. But this one is Treetops Through the Fog. And it's six feet by 13 feet. It's in a private collection. Um, it's uh, amazing. There are 15 different size dots within this. So um, it, it, rather than it, minimizing his flexibility in painting. He was able to take these bende dots and expand on what he was able to do with it through the time. And uh, so in a traditional Chinese view, you get uh, insight into the character and persona of the artist with the way that he's doing this work. Now, in, in, as artists tend to do in their later years, as Renoir did, for example, um, he got involved in creating some nude pictures. So we, what, we have this, um, this one is nude with beach balls. Um, he, you, his women are inventions, their origins can be traced to his archive of comic book clippings. So nobody posed for these. Um, his sources are often altered to achieve greater compositional clarity. So he, the, these heroines who might have been clothed in pictures that he had now are now undressed. Um, and uh, so we have two nudes. And this one, which is nude leaving. So you have your room with uh, your bende dots all over the place. And here she is exiting the picture. Um, kind of fun. Now this was out at the Parish Museum. Um, this is Tokyo Brushstroke One and Two, and this is from 1994. Um, I, the fact that it being called Tokyo is a little misleading because we were it, it was shown out there. Um, and, uh, 
and this is just another view of the same thing. So um, it's now in view, it's the first long-term outdoor installation. Um, and the sculpture was placed uh, um, outdoors on the Bacon family South Meadow, west of the driveway entrance to the museum, which is near Montauk Highway, made of painted and fabricated aluminum. And um, it was done by a company in Rhode Island. So it's taller than the parish museum itself. It's actually um, a, uh, <laughs> uh, 396 inches high and it weighs over 12,000 pounds. Uh, it's, he and his wife Dorothy, as I mentioned, had moved to Southampton to live year round and they had a long enduring relationship with the parish museum. Uh, it organized in 1982 an exhibition of 48 of his paintings including Mickey Mouse. Um, so the, um, this one is at the Smithsonian and it's um, on the south side of the Smithsonian. It's called Modern Head. We saw that when we were doing the Art Deco kind of work. Um, so it's a modern head in many ways. Um, it ha does have a Native American um, texture to it in its own way, but it brings us into the modern time. Uh, it was created in 1974, and um, now we have it silhouetted on an urban skyline. Um, this is a new thing. This is the oh, mermaid hole. He was asked to, to uh, create this. Um, it's a young American in action. It was um, the uh, a packed 95 yacht was the fastest boat in the field, pre-race favorite. The vessel, unfortunately, was damaged um, and in a storm the night before the race, so it never, it was repaired, but it never reached its full potential. Um, he was approached by this elite um, yacht racing syndicate from Maine to design the hull and the spinnaker. This is a close-up of the front of it. Um, and it was for their American Cups um, race. And so this is his version of that. Um, so we get, um, some of his larger sculptures. This is the Barcelona head that we saw in the beginning, um, brushstroke group. And um, this is um, another one. This is uh, from there. This is called Five Brushstrokes. Five Brushstrokes is um, at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. This one here is at the University of Massachusetts. And this one here is at Fairmont Park in Philadelphia. Um, so uh, that basically is, uh, so let me tell you a little bit more about him, because we, we, this is really the last frame of it. Um, he, in 1995, he received the National Medal of Arts. He died of pneumonia in 1997 at New York University Medical Center. He had been hospitalized for several weeks. He survived by Dorothy Herska and his sons, David and Mitchell, from his first marriage. He played really a critical role in subverting the the skeptical view of commercial styles and subjects that were established by abstract expressionism. They didn't want to have anything to do with this. Um, he became one of the important figures in the pop art movement. While his paintings of cartoons and comics are his most recognizable work, he had a prolific and eclectic career that drew from cubism, from surrealism and expressionism. But it's this reimagining of popular culture through the lens of traditional art history that's remained a considerable influence on later generations of artists as pop art went on to significantly inform postmodernism. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I um, enjoyed talking about these artists, so I hope you've also enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. I think I'm on. So, um, I'm going